स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Welcome viewers to MOOC's online course on Introduction to Modern Western Art. Today we will be looking at the evolution of modern Western sculpture from figuration to abstraction. As we all might have noticed that more or less a lot of artists in the history of modern Western art have been trying to reach or at least explore the possibility of abstraction in their art, be it in painting or sculpture. In sculpture, this happened rather rapidly than the paintings. Because in paintings, you should notice that in spite of an interest in abstraction, not many artists actually were interested in doing a kind of a complete abstract art. More or less, they remained in touch with the figurative and the semi-representational idiom. But in the realm of modern Western sculpture, not only we see that there is a gradual progress towards abstraction, but we also come across, which we will be discussing in this lecture and the following lecture, some sculpt who were actually producing a completely non-figurative, non-representational and totally abstract forms in their sculptures. Today in this lecture, we will be briefly looking at two very significant sculptors from this early phase of modern western sculpture, Henry Moore and Brancusi. Now, before we talk about Henry Moore and Brancusi, let us also remind ourselves of that already under this futurist movement, artists like Umberto Boccioni in 1912 was trying to explore these possibilities of abstraction in their works. They have done that to some extent in their paintings and they are doing that also in their sculpture. For example, in this work, though the work has a representative title like the development of a bottle in space, but when you look at the title which comes up almost as a full sentence, it suggests that it is not, the sculpture is not about the form of a bottle. It is actually about the development of bottle in a space, considering that the space is very dynamic, considering that the space is extremely moving and unstable. Then in that context, what happens to the bottle? Does the bottle too remain very static or stable or it also tends to change, if not really physically, but at least conceptually and mentally. So, Boccioni was trying to address these issues which were rather conceptual than visual, but the visual result in the sculptures was moving gradually towards a certain kind of abstraction. Same happened with Alexander Archipenko in his sculpture done in 1915, where the title is pretty descriptive because it says woman combing her hair. But then when you look at the sculpture, it is again not a realistic representation of a woman combing her hair. It is a rather abstract figurative idea of the same subject. And then how does he go about it? He takes help of the liberty that has already been shown by the previous artists like the cubists or futurists or even fauvists in the realm of painting. So, Archipenko was trying to 
explore these possibilities of not straight away going for a realistic representation, but exploring the abstract possibilities inherent in the idea of a sculpture and this is one of his results. Similarly, Jacques Lipschitz in 1917 creates a sculpture called the bather, where anybody who is bathing is not really visible anymore from the sculpture. Probably the idea bather was simply a pretext, an opportunity for the sculptor to explore the a new arrangement, a new kind of arrangement of forms or fragments of a form derived from the idea of a person who was bathing. Now, in 1953, we find much later, Henry Moore was also addressing or exploring certain ideas, sculptural ideas, where representation to a limited extent will be there of course, but it leaves a room, a lot of room for the abstraction to creep in, for the abstraction to kind of emerge in a way that the sculptures ultimately lose the figurative references to a great extent and the sculptures you may say they kind of uh, find their life not in the references or realistic references, but in the abstraction. So, in other words, in the hands of sculptors like Henry Moore, Bracusi and others and later on we shall see the works done by the constructivists and minimalists who to an extreme extent were kind of trying to get rid of the realistic references as much as possible and bring in the power of abstraction. So, from Henry Moore onwards, we see that consistently apart from a few sculptors, most of the sculptors were trying to explore this power of abstraction. That abstraction is not simply running away from the reality, it is not really about escaping the reality, but it is about embracing a different language of expression, where forms, geometry, rhythm, abstract arbitrary volumes can be dealt in a way that they in relationship with, uh, with each other will give birth to a new, new sculptural idea. And along with that what Henry Mood does in many of his sculptures is he magnifies the scale. He also deals with the size, he makes monumental sculpture. Now, in 1939, Henry Mood does this sculpture called Three Points, where you do not find any reference to any figurative experience. There is no suggestion of figure, there is no suggestion of realistic space. It is about, as the title literally suggests, about three sharp points meeting each other. First of all, as a visual form, the sculpture looks pretty interesting, no doubt, but again, it uh, might be little difficult for those viewers who are desperate to find either a narrative meaning or a very clear cut kind of concept or a story from this sculpture. No, this kind of sculpture does not have either a story or a narrative content. This kind of sculptures do not even have uh, how to say a very ideal idea or a ideal concept behind them. It is basically the ideas uh, as you see in the modern sculpture um, by Henry Moore, Bracusi and others. The ideas also derive from the sculpture itself. In the traditional sense or going by the traditional logic, idea is supposed to 
emerge from either your life experience or from your history or from your past or from ancient mythology, religion, so on and so forth. But in modern art and particularly in modern sculpture, we see ideas are emerging from the idea itself. Or you can say ideas emerging from the sculpture itself. So, one sculpture is generating the idea for the next sculpture. The sculpt, it is not necessary for the sculptor to look at the world, at the visual world outside in order to derive ideas. Visual world has always remained a very resourceful kind of area to source your ideas, to have your ideas. But the visual world itself is not a direct supplier of your ideas. In modern sculpture, at least you can see that the language of the sculpture is potentially a very important tool, a kind of strength, an energy which is providing you with lot of ideas. For example, when you look at this sculpture by Henry Moore, though you may try hard to figure out that probably this image is uh, having a reference to a figure and all that, even if there is a reference, that reference is so remote, so vague, so removed from the form that you almost at the end give up to think about the reference and you um, get more interested to enjoy the forms and more importantly the relationship between the forms. Because Henry Moore again is the first modern sculptor to have conceived sculpture in components, in parts. Because you, if you follow the traditional norms of sculpture, a sculpture should have one single physical entity. But Henry Moore, you will see many sculptures by him where he is using a number of parts, smaller parts, bigger parts and arranging them in a way on a single pedestal to form or give the idea of one single sculpture. This again is a wonderful contribution to the history of modern sculpture. To be able to conceive a sculpture not as one single entity, but as a composition, as a kind of um, arrangement of various smaller portions, components or parts which altogether constitute or give meaning to the entire sculptural experience. In fact, in his drawings also, Henry Moore was exploring this idea of uh, the idea of looking at a figure or an object in terms of components, but not like the cubists. Cubists would really love to rearrange the components in terms of multiple viewpoints. This is not something that Henry Moore was doing. Moore was more interested in reducing a whole form into smaller parts and ultimately then rearranging the smaller parts into a complete experience. One of uh, very favorite I would say, one of the very favorite topics or themes which uh, Henry Moore was exploring again and again repetitively was this idea of a reclining figure. It could be a reclining woman or a reclining warrior or a reclining figure and like Rada, Henry Moore takes one step further to make his figures completely anonymous or completely devoid of any identity. In fact, the whole question of the identity of a figure is irrelevant in the context of Henry Moore's works. And this anonymity of figures, unless you are directly doing a portrait of somebody, 
this anonymity of figures will become the hallmark of modern sculpture throughout. Not only in the works of Henry Moore and Bracusi, but also in the works of Giacometti, also in the works of the later sculptors, where the identity of any single person, any single figure is not the issue at all. So, what is the concern then? The concern is the form, is the rhythm of the body, of the various possibilities in which you can reshape a body, reconfigure a body, reform a body, rearrange different parts of the body. And by doing that, if you look at this, Henry Moore or sculptors like him can also arrive at forms which ultimately or eventually loses all kinds of references and become completely abstract. But at the same time, he was also extremely skillful in dealing with semi-naturalistic forms like this, where he can even show a kind of a diaphanous um, drapery on the body of a figure. But though the drapery and the way the drapery is clinging onto the body is pretty naturalistic, if you look at the heads of these figures, once again the heads are completely devoid of any specific identity. So, from specific identity that was a kind of um, a norm in the traditional sculpture, Henry Moore made almost all his sculptures, figural sculptures non-specific in the identity. So, the stylized shape suggests a figure rather than literally representing one figure, carved from wood the knots and wood grain determined its final shape. So, he is giving lot of chance, a lot of uh, kind of uh, he is allowing the material to speak. He is not converting the material into the form. The material itself is participating in shaping the form. So, this is again a very unique kind of feature that is going to be a consistent and a, um, a very regular kind of concern for many modern sculptors that is the role of the medium. Medium for the modern sculptors is no more a tool, medium itself is considered to be a very vibrant, organic and an eloquent component of a work of art. So, let the medium speak, let the medium also determine and dictate the form of the body as much as the form dictates the medium. So, if you notice the open space as far as the bottom uh, sculpture is concerned, the open space carved through the torso of the body, this is completely unrealistic, but it creates a sense of rhythm, it creates a different relationship between the parts of the body. And this opening gives interest to the carving, because you can also almost enjoy the carving. This is again a very important contribution of the modern sculptors, master sculptors like Henry Moore, that when a viewer is looking at his sculptures, he or she is not simply looking at the figures and the movements of the figures or the postures or the abstraction, the viewer is also supposed to enjoy the carving, the carving process that particular figure has undergone. So, is not it very interesting that you are making your sculpture in a way that enables the viewer to enjoy not just the final product, but also at least partly the process, the technical process that this particular form has undergone to reach the final stage. Now, according to Henry Moore, a sculptor is a person who is interested in the shape of things like a poet in words or a musician by sounds. So, in this statement, Henry Moore makes it very, very clear what was his central concern throughout his career as a sculptor. And as it is evident from many of his sculptures, 
that abstraction for Henry Moore was not necessarily an elimination of reality. For Henry Moore, abstraction was a way to reach the essence of the form or the essence of the reality. And in doing so, if you are bound to get rid of certain realistic references, let it be. What you are happy with is the essential idea of a form and its possibilities partly determined by your technical procedure, your material and the medium. Our next sculptor in this lecture is Constantin Brancusi. He worked in the later part of 19th century as well as the entire first two quarters of 20th century. Now, even a brief look at his studio and when you look at some of these pieces of art lying in his studio, you can make out, okay, this artist is also very much interested in abstraction. Though, like Henry Moore, he also had a lot of realistic references in his mind. It was part of his concern, but the central focus was not on realistic representation, rather on the abstract essence of forms. Interestingly, Brancusi was uh, a student of Augusta Roda. Now, despite the fact that he was a student of Roda, he rejected Roda's realism for abstract functionalism, but he almost paralleled Roda's independence because Roda, to a certain extent, he asserted his independence in his forms as a sculptor. Similarly, Brancusi also asserted his independence in his sculptures and as a sculptor in the way he conceived the forms, in the way he executed the forms. For example, in these two sculptures titled as The Kiss and The Bird in Space, the titles are referential, very clear. There is no abstraction in the title, but the way he visualized the form is definitely based strongly on the idea of abstraction as it is very clear. Because what he emphasizes in the sculpture titled case is not really the act of the case or that particular physical intimacy. More than that, Brancusi is interested in emphasizing the form, almost block-like geometrically shaped forms. How to, though it is one single piece, but it appears like these are two separate pieces of sculptures or blocks of stones coming very close together. So, he is making a statement in the language of sculpture as much as he is addressing a very intense and an intimate moment of human relationship. Similarly, when you look at this sculpture, very famous sculpture called the bird in space, here you neither see the bird nor the space. What you see is a sense of flight. Once again, if you go by uh, what um, Brancusi uh, had tried to uh, achieve throughout his life, this is very, very evident from this sculpture and later sculptures also that he was, despite the references of the visual reality, he was not interested in the representation of visual reality. He was interested in capturing the essence of the form. And in order to capture the essence of the form, like Henry Moore to some extent, Brancusi was also following a reductionist method. This is what it is called, technically speaking that you get rid of anything that you feel extraneous, excess, anything that you think is not needed to emphasize the essential aspect of a form. So, you begin to reduce, you begin to erase, you begin to delete a lot of features either from the face or from the figure or from any object. And so, 
following this reductionist method, Brancusi also arrives at his own kind of abstraction. Whereas Henry Moore's abstraction was more uh, associated with the organic possibilities of rhythm, structure, form and components of body. And Brancusi's abstraction was more connected to a reductionist method, where you not only reduce the form into something so simple that now it is able to capture the essence of the form, but you also reduce the form in the sense of simplifying the form. So, reductionist method along with a certain simplification is the main, uh, the central kind of line of procedure, technical procedure as well as conceptual process followed by Brancusi. Even when you look at this work, which is supposed to evoke silence, a table of silence, the, even the measurement between each units, between the units, between the central circular object and the smaller objects around is supposed to evoke silence, tranquility and peace. And all these things are completely intangible, but to capture them, them I mean these issues, these ideas of tranquility, peace, harmony, calmness, quietness, quietitude, to capture this elements in tangible forms, that to in sculpture is definitely a very difficult, a very challenging task. So, what Brakusi does is he plays with the essential simplification of the forms. He also explores the possibility of having or exploiting the distance between the various parts of the form. In other words, Brancusi was an incredible sculptor, who was the first sculptor in the history of art, who was able to evoke silence, not only evoke silence, he was able to actually measure and execute silence in his works. And he did that by simplifying, because he realized that as a sculptor, that more details you have on your sculpture, the sculpture gets more noisy. In order to make the sculpture silent, you need to simplify and get rid of the extraneous and unnecessary details. So, the simplification was not really for Brancusi at least, it was not just to get rid of the realistic references. For him, it was it enabled him to capture, to address and to execute, to actually materialize the essence of certain other ideas like harmony, peace and tranquility. In that sense, though Brancusi's works look very simple and not very simple, it is actually very complex, because a lot of geometry, a lot of measurement, a lot of calculation is also involved in his works, like his famous work called The Endless Column. Now, The Endless Column, like any physical object, of course, has a certain length or height. But what Brancusi intended to evoke was an endlessness of the column. So, though the physically the column stops at a certain height, conceptually, emotionally or psychologically, it is supposed to go on. It is supposed uh, to not have any termination anywhere. It is supposed to be an endless kind of feeling. Now, just by doing or erecting a very long columnar structure is not enough. One had to and this is what Brancusi did very successfully. He actually kind of, he 
measured. He actually measured each and every component of that entire column with some varying degrees of length, height and width, so that visually and psychologically it creates a fantastic impression on our perception that what we are looking at is not something that has stopped at a certain height, but a structure, a sculpture that is going on and on until it reaches the heaven. Thank you.